Should we play the music and the intro and all that like we normally do? What music? We don't we, have music. We should have music. <laughs> no, we don't have music. <laughs> you just you just do your crazy intro and then, and then we're good to go. But can't you can't you like sing or something like that? Why don't you sing? Yolanda's gonna sing a song as an intro. It's gonna be it sound like a doorbell. A <laughs> the reason why is we are always expecting somebody to show up. <laughs> yeah, we're always <laughs> expecting somebody to show up. So today's Watch Party Friday. That's what we do. Everybody has to do watch party. That's what it's called now. Watch Party Friday. Like throwback Thursdays are on Wednesdays. Well, watch party Friday is on today. So make sure you do the little watch party and everybody gets to check it in. Cause today is remember we've been talking about wanting to do this for a while. It's like, boy, what would it be like to have like Frank actually on with us, you know? And we just did the interview with uh Larry, Larry Wilcox. Wilcox from chips and we started talking if you saw the interview it was only supposed to go 45 minutes it went an hour and 25. <laughs> you know larry he's just a nutcase that guy is just keep you laughing and you are not any different no i'm not no not <laughs> since i not since i've gotten older i was a lot older the other day i'm telling you right now i just keep on aging every day <laughs> so every year every year as, as many times as possible, we get to go to the thing called, well, Secret Knock. Secret Knock is a, I would say it's a very influential community where who's who of who is there. And they all come there with zero ego. It's the coolest place in the world. And I've done a few shows there. And I remember meeting this gentleman. And he was like, this is the dude. This is the guy that started Make a Wish Foundation. I'm like, oh, my God. The real guy. The actual guy's like, yeah, it's the real guy. He's like, no way. And and then, and then it was Frank, you know. And I thought, oh, you know, how when you meet somebody, you're intimidated, you don't want to come up to him because, like, you know, I, I, you know, who is this guy? It's like he's the real Santa Claus. Like if there was a real Santa Claus, this would be Frank, you know, with the cowboy hat. With a real cowboy hat. He's a, he's a real cowboy hat, you know. <laughs> he's the, he's the cowboy version of Santa Claus. Yeah, and, yeah. The, the, and, and you think about influential people in your lives, you know, and he's always brought there because. He's an inspiration to so many people out there. Here's a human being that had one asset. He cared about people more than anything else. And that grew to millions and millions and millions of influencing people to do the right thing for those that didn't have much time left. And so when we met Frank, it's like, Every time we go to Secret Knock, we get to see Frank. I'd always go up there and you know, act like I'm just walking by. Like, oh, hey, oh, I didn't see you here, Frank. Really, <laughs> I intentionally walked by him just to, just to be next to him and say hi. That's, you know, how you set yourself up for that. And I and I called, you know, we, we did the interview with Larry. And I said, man, I'd just love to have Frank get on. And I thought, well, call him. Why not? The only thing he could say is not answer or, or say no. And if he doesn't answer, then he didn't say no. And if he answers and says no, then at least we tried. And he was like, nope, I'll rearrange my schedule. And I was like, wow, he must be a real cowboy because real cowboys would do whatever it, you know, <laughs> it is. And so if you've never heard of Make-A-Wish Foundation, then it's your first day on earth. And we want to say happy birthday to the newborns out there <laughs> because I know everybody has. And he's, a, he's an amazing human being. And what he has done, what he's accomplished, what he's gone through. He, he did not get a silver spoon in his, his hand, but he sure gives a lot of golden spoons out. That's for sure. Yeah. So we wanted to bring him on here and just tell you, you've got to see the most powerful movie that will make you smile, laugh, be grateful, and make a difference. Cry. Cry. It makes you cry. Oh, too. you're going to cry. <laughs> you're going to cry. There's, there's a couple, There's more than one time. Let's say you'll just go through all the emotions when you watch that movie because you do. It's, it's a very emotional, um, heart-wrenching you know, true story that just hits home for anybody that watches it. Even if you, even if you've never heard of Make a Wish Foundation, but you know what? You, everybody has heard of it. You know what they do. You know who they help. So this movie will definitely tell the whole story on how it got started and how he was, you know, the person that he actually experienced having to go to a hospital and actually meet a child who didn't have much time left. And to see that transformation in someone um, as an adult, is it's amazing. So you've got to watch it. I, I want to ask her a question when we get started. 
because I remember I was in Scottsdale. I used to live next. I had a gentleman, a friend of mine, I was also a business partner named Bob Greathouse. And he goes, hey, one of the people next door to him was part of Make-A-Wish Foundation. I don't know if they were high end or if it was actually Frank. So I'm going to find out if there's I'll find out right now. You can ask all the questions. So let's get talking. without any. So hey, let's bring him on. The founder, the man that's, you know, the miracle man, what I can call him. <laughs> the uh, the Walt Disney for children, Mr. Frank <laughs> Shankwich. And Frank, he is he's amazing. Thanks for being here, brother. Appreciate it. Look at that cowboy hat and everything. He looked hey. good. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Mark and Lon. I, mean, I really appreciate you inviting me for the show, and I'm sure glad we could squeeze it in the schedule. And but following Larry Wilcox now, that's going to be hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's not going to be hard at all. It's, that's what I said. You know, Larry. Larry says he's a nutcase. You know, and I'll tell you, it's, I'm so glad that we had the opportunity because I remember calling Greg and I says, Greg. The Make a Wish Foundation. I said, has Frank ever met like Larry or or you know Eric? And he goes, no. I says, I'm friends with Larry. Would it be? Can I bring him down? And would that be all right? He goes, dude, bring him down. You know how great he is. And he set it all up, and it was so cool to see that happen. You know, and 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 to see you know when you both get on stage, you if if it wasn't for the TV show, it wouldn't happen. If you weren't a police officer in real life, it wouldn't happen. So everything came together for a reason. You think about influence and, and how many people, boy, oh boy, what a, I mean, you just know that the re God didn't want to take you right away. You had too much work for me out down here. So <laughs> <laughs> no, don't ever quit doing it. But thank you for your time and coming on here. Uh, we, we're, we're excited about it. People are going to do watch parties that are, are doing this. We encourage it. We're, we want to make a difference and make a wish foundation like you have. And for you, that to, that movie was so moving. I have friends that I would call and say, hey, you got to see this movie, Wishman. He goes, I already did. And a lot of people already saw it. And I'm thinking, I said, I know that guy. They go, yeah, okay. Yeah. And nobody believes me. I'm like, no, okay, maybe he doesn't know me, but I met him a couple times, you know? <laughs> well, but, and what we're talking about here, if we can get it on screen without light, Wishman, yeah, wish which is the movie we're talking about, which is currently on Netflix. And in fact, uh, it's been extended for another full year on Netflix because of the popularity. Oh, awesome. Uh, but also when we were in theatrical releases uh, in 2019, uh, we became, and this is just amazing for cast, crew, the producers, everything else, became qualified for Academy Award nomination for Best Picture. Now, oh. we, we knew we weren't going to do that. But to be included with the big boys was just such an honor, like I say, for the cast, crew, the production company a low budget independent movie to all of a sudden get qualified for best picture. That's well, awesome. it, it is, it is a, it is a Hollywood quality picture. There's no question about it. The acting in it, the storyline, everything was, it, I hope it wins. It should win. And it, because and I think every kid, every kid in school should watch the movie, make it mandatory. Then you realize we all have challenges in life. We go through Frank knife isn't perfect. And maybe it wasn't supposed to be perfect because who would you have become if it was perfect for you? And now you get to have the perfect life. And how many children, millions of children and families were influenced because of the pain you had to endure and the things you had to go through that. I don't want to give away the movie, but you see the movie, you're like, this isn't a guy that was saying, hey, here's a couple million dollars, son. Why don't you just go start a, start a foundation? Wasn't like that at all. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> And, and it's funny you mentioned about the movie Children Watching it because we never pictured, we found out the demographic for the audience uh, that are watching this movie is from seven years old on up. And we never pictured the youngsters in this because there's a couple swear words in the movie, but the mom and dad will let them watch it. But I receive it, I'm boasting here a little bit, but also flattered, probably 10 to 15 messages every day from all over the world, especially from children. Now, what's so much fun is yesterday, I got one from a young lady, I can't remember her name, nine years old, in Ireland. And oh. she said, I have real long hair. I cut my hair and sold it and donated the money to the Make-A-Wish Foundation chapter of Ireland. Oh, wow. Wow. I mean. <laughs> Man, Frank. And, and the message of the movie is everyone can be real. Help somebody out. Give back when you can. And here's a nine-year-old, and that's just one little sample that's giving back to the community, even at that young age. 
Yeah, and 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 you think about because of you and and the things you've gone through. And what's interesting is if you know people that meet you, I, there is you are as real as. <laughs> I lost you on audio. There we go. Oh, there, there we go. go. I don't again. know what happened. <laughs> Some, sometimes, sometimes the internet doesn't want me to say a word. Well, if you remember it's secret not, Gregory could always say, sometimes they're technical glitches and we just live with them, right? That's, That's right. Fact. We can't change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no matter what, I mean, you've always been courteous. It's like you're just who you are. You've never changed. It's, I mean, you're still a grateful human being and you say hi to everybody. You give everybody you know, the time they need. It's not like you're, hey, I, you don't know who I am. I've never seen that. And I've never heard anybody talk about that with you. It's just like you were put here to do something. You got it done and it became bigger than life. And well, I was taught to be humble starting as a very young boy. And I just appreciate, I mean, especially in the new speaking career that people may know I'm a retired homicide detective, 42 years uh, with Arizona State Police. Uh, and have this whole new career. So fortunate to have this new career. And then ended up boasting again a little bit, the 2016 Forbes number one keynote speaker. But when people actually pay or use their time to come and see me, I mean, how flattering is that? And then the meet and greets afterwards. I don't want to be the guy that just, oh, okay, hi, thank you, goodbye. They're yeah. taking the time to come and see me. I want to take the time to talk to them. Especially wow. if they come up, hi, can I get your picture? Well, of course. But first of all, what's your name? Where are you from? What do you do? We just get that connection going. Because they're trying to make me feel special. I want to make them feel special in return. Yeah, well, well you definitely made us feel right at home. Like, you know, you were, you were Uncle Frank to us. It's like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> he started the make wish Foundation. And he's the name. It's not important. It's just Frank. Okay, it's Uncle Frank. <laughs> And, and now it's Grandpa Frank, so. <laughs> that, uh, oh, now you are, yeah. <laughs> if I didn't have this beard, I could be, I could be, you know, hey, Grandpa Frank, but now there you go. <laughs> so you were in law enforcement. Hey, I, let, I mean, without giving the movie away, your story, you didn't grow up to be a person that wanted to start a foundation or anything like that. You grew up in the police department being a police officer and you didn't have the easiest childhood. Just, just so people get clear, you need, you know, people say, well, I'm this way because of my parents were this way. And they have a negative attitude in life where the fact is you turned your whole life around and made something that was very hard to be so, you know, influential and grateful in this world. You know, if they see the movie, they'll be like, you talk about a hero. You, yeah. you, need, a, you need to be honored as the you know, number one hero in this country. And then you would say, no, that's okay. There's probably somebody else that, you know, like, that's who you are. <laughs> Frank, take the goddamn hero thing, okay? You're a hero. And, and. Well, you know, I was so fortunate. And I was raised, I was raised in a different era in, in the late 40s, early 50s. And in that period of my life, so many mentors I had developed. And just real quickly, if uh, we have time, uh, yeah. I was born in Chicago at two years old. My mother divorced my father uh, from ages two to, she left and we never knew where. Uh, ages two to six, fun years living with my grandparents, my aunts, uncles, cousins, uh, Saturday night dinners, going out to picnics, the movies, everything else. I mean, just fun, fun years, great memories. At uh, six years old, I'm in a kindergarten playground. A lady grabs me. She says, I'm your mother. I have no idea who she was and started dragging me off the playground, kicking and screaming. And this threw me in a car. And this changed my whole life at that point because she wanted to take me away from my father who had custody. And we ended up in uh, Northern Michigan. Uh, and she said, this is where we're gonna live until we get the money to go to Arizona. And living in Northern Michigan the first summer was living in a tent. She was very, very poor. And all of a sudden this for me started a survival an existence of a city boy, but all of a sudden thrown in the country right on the shores of Lake Michigan. And, and how to take care of myself because she was gone all the time. And the next five years were very difficult. When the winters came, living in a car, living in flop houses, just nasty, uh, hungry all the time. But developing that self survival type thing that you either give up or you, you do that. 
And at age 10, my father found us. And when he went to get the authorities to arrest her, as we start in the movie at this point, um, threw everything we had and said, now we're going to Arizona in an old Jeep. And it took six weeks to go to Arizona. And because she didn't have, from Michigan to Arizona, she didn't have the money. We'd drive a half a day, we'd stop a little town, she'd get a job in a wrestling, just enough for tip money. They thinking they're gonna stay there for a while, enough for gas and off we go again to the next town. We ran out of money of gas, sleeping in the car the whole way. But just, we ended up in Arizona, Selectman, Arizona, up on Route 66. And it's the first time I'd ever seen her cry. Just outside this little town, 500, um, she said, we have no money, no gas. I don't know what I'm going to do. A rancher stopped by, said, what's going on? She told him the story. He said, stay here. I'll bring some gas. Follow me back to the ranch house. And he said, you can stay with us until you get settled in this little town. I mean, just think about this. Total strangers that he took us in. And for six weeks, our, our, our bedroom was on the kitchen floor in a couple bedrooms. But we had shelter. We weren't in a leaky tent. We were sleeping in the car. His wife, Thelma, uh, biscuits and gravy every morning. The first time I actually having breakfast. Still my favorite food. We <laughs> 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 never get enough. <laughs> hey, that's good. You like biscuits Five and gravy every year. Next time I get to Arizona, I'm taking the bit for biscuits and gravy, Frank. Open Sligman, definitely. But um, um, my mother got a job as a maid. There's only a few little motels in town. Again, on over at 66. This is the early 50s. And I got a job 10 years old as a dishwasher, washing dishes full time. Well, 38 hours. That's all they would allow. But I started watching a gentleman across the street, a Mexican gentleman. He's building something. And I just went over there. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, what's your name? And I said, my name is Frank. He said, no, from now on, you're Pancho, meaning Frank in Spanish. <laughs> And he said, my name is Juan, but the people in town here call me Juan. And I could see the <laughs> smile. And he said, grab a hammer, kid. Now, I had never had this father figure. I, I said, I don't know what to do. He said, I want you to help me build this, which turns out to be the iconic snow cap on Route 66, which is like a Dairy Queen. But the tour buses out of Vegas when it's running, I mean, because of the corona right now, 11 or 12 tour buses go to Sligman just to go to this little snow cap, just to wow. meet people in there. But he became my father figure. He became my mentor. He taught me so many things. I had never played sports. He got me involved with sports. He got me involved with music. Uh, the first time I had a school I was actually going to all the time. Uh, predominantly, except Mexican Indian this town. I'm the novelty with the freckles and red hair. <laughs> but that didn't make any difference in those days because everybody was just kids. Everybody was poor. But the biggest thing he said to me, Frank, when you can give back, now, this is, again, mid-50s, it's a popular term today. What do you mean you want to give back? We don't have a thing. The poor people are helping us. He said, exactly. Look at the widow Sanchez. When she can, she's bringing you and your mom beans and tortillas. But look at her front porch. It needs sanded and painted. Look at the yard. It's full of weeds. You're big enough. You can do that. You don't have to have money to give back. You can wow. give back your time. What a lesson. And that stayed with me my whole life. But then when I started uh, seventh grade, my mother, we got an old travel trailer that we were living in. And uh, I came home one day and it's being hooked up to pick up. I said, what's going on? She said, I can't afford you anymore. I'm moving. And all of a sudden, my trailer goes down the road. And I go to Juan and obviously I'm upset. What do I do? And he said, I knew what was going on. He said, I want you to learn. I'll remember this the rest of your life, how to turn those negatives to positive. Juan, what do you mean? My house just left. He said, I've arranged for you to live with Widow Sanchez. She's going to charge you $20 a week room and board. And he said, you make $26 a week as a dishwasher. Now, every money I met always went to my mother, no my own money. And he said, the first time in your life, you're going to have $6. And that's a lot of money to a kid. If, if food and housing and everything is provided at that time, that's a positive. He said, for the first time in your life, you're going to have, outside when I was a real little kid, your own bedroom. You're going to have indoor plumbing, showers. No more going to the Santa Fe locker room to shower and everything. That's a positive. She's the best cook in town. Well, <laughs> there was no doubt on that. That's a positive. <laughs> and plus, she got the first television set in Seligman, Arizona, one channel, but it had the Mickey Mouse Club. That was a positive. <laughs> so, again, learning that. I just remembered that my whole life just remembered that. And then when I started uh, high school, my mother called me 
She said, I need you to move to Prescott, the town I live in now in Northern Arizona. I, I need help financially. Now, Juana told me, he says, I know you don't have a good relationship with your mother, but remember, she is your mother and you will respect her. And I remembered that. And I said, okay, I'll move. I'll help you. I got a job right away. Which is so interesting, people helping out again. Uh, I had practiced football in Seligman. They didn't have like pop war or anything, but I practiced starting in seventh grade with the high school team. I wanted to learn the sport. I obviously couldn't play, but I practiced. And when I went to Prescott, I, I tried out for the freshman team. The coach says, I don't know where you learned this, but you're going to make first string immediately. And I had to take an aptitude test um, for especially mathematics, changing schools, and I failed. And the coach came up and he said, they're going to put you back in eighth grade. Now, that's the first time I was devastated. I couldn't find positives there. But the coach says, you know what? I'm going to tutor you all summer. And before school starts, we're going to test you again, which he did, which they did, which I passed. But again, here's somebody helping me out. And I want to make sure I did everything I could, the best player I could, whatever I could for that coach and still remain friends today. And we're talking back in the uh, mid-50s now. Wow. But again, following following uh, high school, I went into the Air Force. This is Vietnam era, uh, and I'm not a combat veteran. In fact, I was stationed in England, but my and I was Air Police that they call it then. And I my my superior saw something special and asked me to apply for the Honor Guard, the base Honor Guard on our base in England, which I did. I passed everything, and was assigned to the Honor Guard. Now during high school. I was a big fan of World War II history, both the uh, Europe and uh, Pacific theaters, and really studied Winston Churchill. I just admired that man. Well, one of my paybacks as the honor guard was when Sir Winston Churchill died, I was assigned to his honor guard. I mean, to me, what a thrill, just as this young boy, to be on this gentleman. But again, this is because people saw something. And I always gave the 100% that I could to make sure I would, I would give back what they were giving me. So then following the Air Force, wanted to work for Motorola for seven years. Um, they were looking for people, especially Vietnam era veterans that had top secret clearance, which I had. Um, and I was assigned to the uh, Atlas Missile Program. And they sent me to school. I used a GI Bill. My math teachers that I mentioned earlier got a kick out of this. I ended up in statistical engineering. Determining. <laughs> 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 The, determining the probability of uh, failure rate of certain components for that missile program. And Motorola was so good. I mean, so much money, advancement, unbelievable. Like I said, going to school, uh, getting the house, getting a new car. But I wasn't really happy there. I didn't like living in Phoenix. I'm nothing against Phoenix, folks. I just a country <laughs> <laughs> boy. <laughs> Here come the emails. Let's go, Phoenix. Yeah. And, and several of my friends are joined the Arizona Highway Patrol. And they kept saying, Frank, with your air police background, with your engineering background, you'd be a perfect fit. I said, guys, I make in one week what you make in a month. I'm just not going to give that up. I've got the best lifestyle ever I've had in my life. But I just started thinking about it on a whim. I put in an application. And it was 1,000 people that applied. They chose 50. I was one that they chose. Will you accept the position? Yes, I will. Probably the smartest move I ever made going to the academy because, like I said, 42 years. Years later, finally retired. <laughs> this again leads to Juan uh, Delgadillo. My first assignment was down in Yuma, Arizona as a car officer. That's right on the Mexican border, California border. And I was continuing taking college classes. The uh, college football coach introduced himself and he said, I know your coach is from Prescott. And he said, well, have you ever heard of Special Olympics? Well, no coach, I haven't. What is that? He explained to me the program. He said, I would really like you in your off duty if you would start working with these kids in the football throw, the basketball hoops, and so on, the baseball throw. Coach, I'd like to do that. I never had so much fun working with these kids. I mean, yeah. it was just a blast. And as I'm doing this, all of a sudden I thinking, because I'm so busy now up until this point, that one, I think I'm finally starting to give back. It's taken me a lot of years, but I'm starting to give back. And uh, mid-70s, the Arizona Highway Patrol decided they're going to start a motorcycle program again. It was going to be a 10-man motorcycle tactical squad that worked the whole state of Arizona. And they asked me uh, to apply and get to see if go through training. Now, here's what's interesting, talking about Larry Wilcox <laughs> later. 
<laughs> we, we did our initial training with California Highway Patrol at their motorcycle school. And our equipment was identical. Our, our uniforms were identical, except obviously ours said Arizona. All right. But we started up a unit and 10 man unit. We usually worked in two man teams driving all through Arizona, the little towns and so on. A couple of weeks of one town, a couple of weeks of another. And during this time, the mid 70s now, the TV show Chips became very popular, especially yeah. the younger kids. The demographic was seven years old on up for the boys. Seven for the girls, seven year olds up to about 60 for the ladies because of Ponch and his smile and so on. <laughs> yeah. My brother's favorite TV show is Chips, my little brother. And, and we started going to these little towns, riding in two man teams, and all of a sudden the kids are yelling, Hey, Ponch, hey, John, hey, Chips, and just waving at us instead of kind of, Oh, here's the police, kind of afraid. And I asked our commanders, Can we start going to this grade schools, uh, some off duty times, and just talk about bicycle safety? And they said, sure, it might be great PR. Well, we did. The kids could care less about bicycle safety. They wanted to crawl on a motorcycle. But it was great PR. We had so much fun with the kids. Then we get to a point where in 1978, uh, I'm in Park, Arizona. Our whole 10-man team are working Park, Arizona. Park, Arizona is right on the California border, separated by the Colorado River. Uh, it's the party place during Easter break. especially Yes, it is. Well, Little town of Parker, 2,000, grows to 85,000 up and down. Uh, fatal accidents, rapes, homicides, uh, drug overdoses, you name it, it's just going on constantly. I was involved with a high-speed chase with a drunk driver, 85 miles on a 25 zone, when another drunk driver pulled directly in front of me. I couldn't do what we call a break and escape mover. I hit him broadside at 85. <laughs> I was told the crash was spectacular. Um, and that's pronounced dead at the scene. Yeah. Now, you and I are talking, so there's always another story, right? <laughs> <laughs> my, my partner tried to revive me. He couldn't do it. He called the code 963A, officer killed in the line of duty. Now, every officer I've ever worked with, including myself, we believe in a higher being, Mark. Uh, whatever whatever right. the faith might be, go right. to work every day, say a little prayer, please allow me to come home. You get home at night, thank you for allowing me to come home. And I believe in garden angels, not the wings type thing, but God sends down somebody to help you. Right. And God sent down, in this case, an off-duty emergency room nurse from California. And she told my partner, I'm going to bring him back. He said, he's dead. We have nothing. She didn't listen, obviously. Again, we're talking. And four minutes performed CPR at heart massage and obviously brought me back to life. And it, it, it was just a very traumatic thing. And I resulted in that, that crash injuries with a traumatic brain injury, skull fracture, a lot of broken bones, missing skin, and had to do a lot of therapy afterwards, both physical and mentally. And one of the things the therapist asked me was the, the psychologist, do you remember going through the tunnel? And I didn't even think about that. And he said, when a lot of people die, they go through the tunnel. As your life goes away, it, the light just closes, this is especially in emergency room situations. And as your life comes back, this little light starts opening up and you can see and that tunnel opens up. And he said, you remember, I said, I recall that now. He said, you remember wow. everything about your senses? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, your senses coming back because you're coming back to life. Now, every police officer, we got to have a little bit of humor in this job, right? We can't, we can't <laughs> do the thing every day that we see and do. And I said, well, doc, I, I, I do. The first thing I remember is the sense of hearing. I'm hearing sirens in the background. I'm hearing somebody saying, she's brought them back. She's brought them back. I really don't know what they're talking about. Uh, the, the sense of touch, uh, something, something is on my lips. Something is tickling my face. The sense of smell, some very pleasant type odor. Uh, the sense of sight. I open my eyes and hear this beautiful blonde with a lip lock on me. <laughs> and if this is heaven, okay, I'm, I'm happy with this. <laughs> Now, I learned later that my partner also was doing CPR. Now, this is a big, ugly guy, mustache full of bugs. If I would have walked up to him, I mean, it would have been traumatic. I would have never. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Skip. But <laughs> but at the end of the counseling session, the, the counselor said to me, he said, you know you died at night. I said, well, okay. He said, you know God spared you for a reason. And now it's up to you to find that reason. Wow. 
And it was two years later that I found that reason. I'm way up in the mountains in northern Arizona patrolling on motorcycle. Now, this is before the days of internet or cell phones. we got to remember this is 1980. And I get a call from the dispatcher. Check out at the nearest payphone. We have emergency traffic. It does not involve your family. It's 45 miles to the nearest payphone. I call in. She said, a U.S. Customs agent named Tom Austin has befriended a little boy named Chris. Chris is seven years old and has terminal leukemia. Chris's heroes are Ponch and John from the television show Chips. And he told his mother, when I grow up, I wish I could be a motorcycle officer just like Ponch and John. And Agent Austin called the Highway Patrol and said, is there any way that maybe he could meet one of the motorcycle officers? And because maybe working with the kids the years before, they chose me to be that officer that he was going to meet. Now, Chris is in a hospital bed in Phoenix uh, on IVs. But with permission of his mother and his doctor, they allowed our state police helicopter to pick him up and fly him to our headquarters building. And they timed it where, because it was 100 and some miles yet, I had to get down Phoenix. But we timed it via radio calls and that were just as the helicopter was approaching the landing zone, I was pulling into the landing zone. Now, I had no idea what to expect. I mean, I had never let this little boy, he's on IVs. Uh, all I can see is it's approaching is his face with a big grin against a helicopter glass, right? <laughs> <laughs> helicopter lands, I expected the paramedics to help him out. I mean, this is a little boy that's very sick. Little red peekers, sneakers, jumps out of that helicopter, runs with the most sorry. Hi, I'm Chris, can I get on? Well, of course you can, Chris. He is laughing and grinning. Now, he watched ships so much. And remember, I said our equipment was identical to California Highway Patrol. This is the red lights. Can I turn it on? This is a siren. These are the flashes. What's in your saddlebag is the same as punch. He is just having a ball. And I'm looking at his mother, and she's crying. Why, why is she crying? Then it dawns on me. She has her seven-year-old back. He's not laying on a hospital bed, literally dying. He's out there having a good time. But Chris went on that day to become the first and only honorary highway patrol officer in the history of the highway patrol, including his own badge that's still assigned to him today, his smoky hat, the certificate making him a, a, a fellow officer, honorary officer. And he got to go home that night. The doctor said, I don't understand what's going on, but his vitals are so good. Take him to his comfort zone. Now, we felt good about what we did. And one of the officers said, well, we have a highway patrol officer who needs a uniform. And in those days, they were custom made. Go to the uniform shop. This is our closing. We've got this little boy named Chris. He's seven years old. He's about this wide, this high. We make a uniform for Chris. Two ladies spent all night making this uniform for Chris. Aww. I get permission the next day to leave several motorcycles, several squad cars to Chris's house. And red lights and siren, eight in the morning. You can imagine the neighbors, right? A very nice neighborhood. What the heck is going on here? <laughs> Chris comes running out, a big smile. We hand him his uniform. He's a quick change artist. Runs in the house, runs out, come on, just beaming, just strutting, beaming. And he comes over to me and he says, can I get on your motorcycle? Well, of course you can, Chris. And he's looking at me and he starts touching the wings on my uniform, the motorcycle wings, motorcycle officers wear. And this is the first time I heard this word from him. He says, I wish I could be a motorcycle officer. Uh -huh. And I said, Chris, well, I'm going to tell you the training we go through. And I explained the training. I said, it's a shame you don't have a motorcycle. <laughs> we would train you right here. We'd put traffic cones in and we'd train you right now. This little kid's a step ahead of me. He runs in the house, comes riding out on a little battery operated motorcycle. And his mother <laughs> got for him in place of a wheelchair. He's got on the motorcycle helmet we gave him. Where he got aviator glasses is beyond me. But what really cracked me up is the motorcycle officers wear the high top boots, leather boots. He had what we call on a ranch, the high top rubber mucking boots. Oh. <laughs> where he got those who knows i'm ready for my test he goes through the cones he came back that i passed yes you did very serious when do i get my wings well chris those are special order they're not just off the shelf a jeweler makes those for us i said i promise you i will get you your wings and we did this little scene in a movie called the cowboys binding contract that we shake hands so i said i will promise i will give you that's where that came for the scene in the movie Oh, okay. A couple days later, I pick up the wings. Just as I pick up the wings, the dispatcher tells me to call again. I call in. Chris is in a hospital in a coma, probably not going to survive the day. You have permission to go to the hospital. I go to the hospital. He's in a coma. His uniform is hanging right by his bed. Just as I pin on the wings, he comes out of that coma. 
He looks at me with a weak grin, a very weak voice. I'm a motorcycle officer now. Yes, you are, Chris. His wish had become true. I hand him his uniform. He rubs his wings. He shows his mother a little smile, a little giggle, a very weak thank you. A couple hours later, he passed away. I always like to think maybe those wings helped carry him to heaven. Yeah. Now, we, my commanders contacted me a couple of days later and said, we have lost a fellow officer. And we just learned that Chris is going to be buried in a little town called Kiwani, Illinois, about 180 miles uh, southwest of Chicago. I want you and your partner to go back and give him a full police funeral, which we did. Now, again, before the days of Internet, but the media is picking up what we're doing. And we land in O'Hare and we're met by all the major networks, the CBS, ABC, NBC, interviewing us at the airport about our mission. Now, what they didn't tell us as we arrived in this little town of Kiwani, that we're met by Illinois State Police, city police, county police to help bury this little trooper. Oh, and Chris was buried in uniform, his great marker reads, Chris Gracious, Arizona trooper. And, but flying home back to Arizona, I just started thinking, here's a little boy who had a wish and we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? And the ending of this long story is that's where the idea came about, maybe 35,000 feet over Kansas or somewhere. Let's let a child make a wish and we'll make it happen. And that's how we started the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Wow. How many people showed up at the funeral that little boy? I'm sorry? How many people showed up at the funeral for that little boy? We had approximately 12 police officers. Wow. And again, this is a Kiwani, a very little, little community, maybe a thousand people. Uh, in the middle of nowhere. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, and and is that is that where you got back with your dad in that town? Well, uh, no, no. Uh, remember, Wish Man is based on a true story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Based on a true story. <laughs> Hollywood likes to embellish a lot of things, which yeah. is which is why it, which is why it took two and a half years for the writer and director Theo Davies, who did a fantastic job, to write this because I had script approval. I've worked with Hollywood before. I know how they embellish. So it was a give and take throughout the whole writing of the screenplay. Yeah. I wish, I, I mean, I'd like to have seen you actually in the movie as one of the actors because then they wouldn't know who it really was, you know? <laughs> that would have been so cool, you know? Maybe one of the police officers or something. I know that Larry did a uh, little cameo. was kind of cool, you know? I've never seen that. <laughs> well, yeah, it was so fun with Larry Wilcox because when we were talking about like I said, we had met Larry and we're getting a screenplay. And for the custom agent, I thought, what a great, I called Larry. We, we do a cameo in this. Of course I will. And then especially Robert Pine, if anybody remembers Chips. Yeah. Uh, Robert Pine say, played Sergeant Cretier in Chips. And he was an identical, his, his, in Chips, the identical personality of my real motor sergeant. And I, I called Larry. I said, I want to I want to talk to Robert, see if he'd be interested in that part. Talked to Robert. He auditioned for it. He liked it. Thank God he came on there because what what a he brought so much maturity to the set for these younger actors in there. But you mentioned about if I had a cameo, I do have a cameo in a movie. The director side of my face wasn't that good for the camera, but in the closing <laughs> scenes, closing <laughs> scenes, you get to see my backside riding a motorcycle into the sunset. He figured that was my best profile shot. Was my backside. Not my face. So I do have a cameo in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you made it in your own movie. That's good. <laughs> well, well, it's just amazing that the things that you, uh, you know, where our life takes us and all that, based on a true story. It's uh, most. It's one of the most powerful stories we've seen, and it really gives us an opportunity to say, you know what? Which one we think our life is bad? Go to a children's hospital and watch the children be grateful to be alive, and then we won't worry enough mayonnaise on our sandwich or they burnt our chicken or internet slow you know so it really it really woke woke Yolanda up to really be so grateful for every little thing and even during our live events now we have a charity we always give to we do lunch lunch, lunch learn contribution because we want to make sure we're always giving and one of the inspirations were because of the movie and because yeah. of you and it, it's it's a great feeling to be able to do that that well, these yeah. do a lot of appearances still now or no? I'm sorry. Do you do a lot of appearances as? Oh well? yeah, yeah. Uh, because of Corona, obviously we're shut down. But I was, I'm on a 
I'm on an airplane usually every week, every other week somewhere. Um, in fact, they just tracked me for the 2018, this Google track, which I didn't know I had. And last year I was around the world three times. Holy and, cow. Uh, <laughs> and it's, just, it's just not promoting movie, but speaking engagements. But it also gives me a platform. Uh, I, I mentioned that now I set on several nonprofits around the nation. Uh, it's given me a little credibility and so on that I can help develop these nonprofits, help promote these nonprofits. And again, this is the whole thing about giving back when you can. It doesn't take money to give back and give back your time. Yeah. Well, I, I, I remember one of our business partners, we were doing some stuff. He lived in Scottsdale and his neighbor was something with Make-A-Wish Foundation. Either she was high in the board or, and I was like, really? You know somebody that's actually right there? It's like, she was like one of the first ones. And I don't remember that you didn't live in Scottsdale, did you, Did you, Frank? No, no. Okay, she must have been no, on no. the board. But for a while, for a while, I did live in the Phoenix area in, in Chandler, Arizona, uh, before they transferred me back up north. Well, it's a, it's a lot harder, hotter in Phoenix than it is in Prescott. So. Oh yeah, we're at <laughs> we're 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 at almost six thousand feet now. We're having a heat wave today. It's going to be about ninety two <laughs> compared to Phoenix at one hundred and sixteen, one hundred and eighteen. So. Yeah, it's it's yeah. My I love Prescott. We go we used to go up there all the time. My mom wanted to live up there. I mean, it's just so beautiful, you know. And uh, she moved to Payson instead of Prescott, so. <laughs> but I love Prescott, you know. I remember the little town there, and little square, and everything else. Used to go down there all the time for for just like lunch or something like that. So, yeah, at the it's famous Palace, at the famous Palace Bar and Restaurant, <laughs> back dated back from the old Wyatt Earp days. There's still oh, bullet holes in the ceiling. Wow. wow. Yeah. <laughs> so you've been home for quite a while with this uh, the COVID going on, then longer than you've ever been home, huh? Yeah, our last our last trip was the end of March, and then everything shut down since then. But I'm so fortunate, like yourself, you're inviting me to do the, these uh, webinars, these podcasts, and so on. So we get the word out there. Everything that's been canceled is already starting to be rescheduled towards the end of uh, September, October, and already rebooked into 2021. So, uh, so hopefully this will be all over. And you never took any money for Make-A-Wish Foundation as a personal salary, have you? Oh, no, no. I was the first president and CEO. And I wanted to base this to this whole foundation on character, on integrity, especially accountability. Um, and I, I never took a salary because I, people say, oh, that was very noble of you. Well, I had a job. Why would I want to have a job? But again, it was also the integrity part. Well, what is this cop up to? Is he trying to make some money, stick it in his pocket? And that's why the accountability, transparency. Folks, the press, the books are open at any time. You come in here and see where the money's going. Yeah. Even after, and you know the term surround yourself with people smarter than you. <laughs> <laughs> I did, especially when I married. But, <laughs> <laughs> but after a, a little while with Make a Wish, uh, at the beginning, I had to make a career choice. I couldn't do both. And I was an excellent cop. I got the awards, but I didn't know that much about the nonprofit. And our board made the very wise decision. Let's start hiring somebody in the nonprofit world to make this grow, which it has. There's been 10 uh, CEOs over the years, 40 years now, which has made it grow to this worldwide foundation that it is. So it's not just in the U.S., it's worldwide? Worldwide. We have 62 chapters in the United States. 45 international chapters on five continents. Wow. And to date, we're approximately over a half a million wishes granted worldwide, all because of one little boy that wanted to be a motorcycle officer. That is so awesome. Yeah, and I think it's one man that got a good guidance from the, the man that needed to come in your life, you know? And oh, definitely, definitely. If I hadn't had... My mentor one, my coaches, my teachers, my supervisors in, in the Air Force with the Highway Patrol. Yeah. And you listen, every you know, it's not all puppies and lollipops. Everybody's got a hiccup in their life. But it's what you do with it. And that's what those mentors taught me. You know, you've got bad times, but it's what you do with those bad times. Again, to turn those negatives into positives. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, I love it every time I, I see you, hear you speak. You're just an inspiration. I don't think there's a bigger organization out there that one man like yourself ever created that got the massive attention and the the global international recognition to give back so much as Make a Wish Foundation. And you think about that, it's it's almost overwhelming for you and not real in a way, isn't it? Well, it, it, it is overwhelming a lot of times. And again, now remember, it's a team thing. <laughs> I had an idea that made it work, but it takes literally thousands of people around the world to make it work. But what I get, uh, the new figure is every 28 minutes, somewhere in the world, a wish is granted. That, that it, for me, still is hard to comprehend. But look, now we're going to talk today, maybe an hour, so a wish and a half, or maybe even two wishes have been granted somewhere in the world during this interview. That's awesome. That's, yeah, two wishes just from our conversation. <laughs> yeah. When you go to bed at night, you wake up, 16 wishes were granted. If you're it, sleeping, eight. <laughs> and also, uh, for people to know that when we started this was for uh, children with terminal illnesses in the uh, early 80s, leukemia, children didn't survive. <clears throat> but through the grace of God and modern medicine, the mission was changed about 20 years ago, actually, to children with life-threatening illnesses. <clears throat> because more and more children, in fact, are surviving. Yeah. So that, that's just great. And then our original charter is still there. Someday we hope to go out of business. <clears throat> yeah, what's the there, might be, there might be childhood cancers. Wow. What's the youngest child that you granted a wish to? Well, the age range from two and a half to 18. Wow. Oh, good. Okay. And the reason we chose two and a half, and again, this is from learning from resident interviewing, especially in homicide and so on, a child can comprehend at two, two and a half years old. <clears throat> if you ask them, uh, what's your favorite toy? Which, what would you like to go? They already know about Disneyland. They already know. I, I want I want something. I want a Barbie, whatever it might be at that young age. Yeah. yeah. What, 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 at that young age. Yeah. What, was, what was the craziest wish that somebody wanted? Uh, is this a R-rated show? or? <laughs> <laughs> We're in, all the <laughs> in the uh, Phoenix area, down in the Phoenix area, there's a Hickam farms which raises chickens and it supply the eggs to this whole arizona even on california new mexico and so on and a chicken ranch is what it's called like a chicken ranch <clears throat> and a 16 year old boy said i want to visit the chicken ranch <laughs> and the two ladies well we know what we're talking about already right yeah of course they live in vegas <laughs> yeah we know what you're the, the two ladies that were the wish granters said, well, we're going to do that. And somehow I got involved in that. And this little boy, they said, we're going to grant your wish. Well, you can imagine a 16-year-old, he is just ecstatic. I'm going to get visit the chicken ranch, which up in the Reno area is a house for soil doves, a house <laughs> of ill repute. <laughs> <laughs> and when the lady, when I told them what it was, what he was looking for, oh, my God, they're so embarrassed. So I <laughs> have to go to Disney World instead. <laughs> Quite a difference. <laughs> hey, you know, <laughs> Jen knew what he wanted. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you said you said any wish. You weren't specific. <laughs> no right. bound wishes, right? <laughs> Did well, you well, try any, any, any wish that's requested, we do our best to request it. Very few are turned down. Uh, back in the days of the, the PETA, the PETA, however you want to say it, uh, there was a lot of hunting wishes, fishing wishes we did. They just came down so hard, actually made threats against staff members. Uh, we had one that wanted to do a bear hunt, a moose hunt, and uh, the family, that's what they did. Yeah. yeah. But but we, we finally got out of that. We're not doing that anymore. The foundation is not doing that anymore, but it's there's other, but there's other organizations that will grant that that we turn the family over to that will grant those type of wishes. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. So they still get to do what they they want to do and not judge on what they you know, wish of them is. So that's good. Right, right. There's a lot of celebrity uh, celebrity things, huh? Who was the biggest celebrity that somebody wished they could meet and they they came to? Uh, John Cena, the wrestler. 
Yes. 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 Yeah, I think him and Dwayne Johnson are right almost tie to tie for granting wishes. Uh, oh, and, and and they're they're not the type. Now John's not too tough. I got a picture of me with him and I got him in a headlock. You know, <laughs> me let go, but uh, <laughs> thanks, John, for letting me do that. <laughs> but but so so many celebrities, it's not just okay. Get a picture, hi, get the autograph, spend ten minutes. They spend a full day, a half day, just hanging out with these kids. I mean, just think of how much that means to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they they truly did get to die in peace, knowing that they had all hundred percent love, and it means so much, you know. Or they get to live with that memory. Oh, um, you know, if they get well, um, that's also a good inspiration for them to you know keep fighting. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, and, and just what you're saying, Lana. We call that the power of a wish. Oh yeah. And there, there's so many what we call a rush wish. A doctor will notify the family, uh, the wish granters. If we're going to do this wish, we need to do it within the next six months or a year. This child is not going to survive. This child yeah. is so real. They're, they're well enough to do the wish. Let's say it's a travel wish. Disney is so popular. They come back and they go in total remission. Wow. And I was on a yeah. study on this over 20 years ago, but doctors can't figure it out. And I said, it's the power of a wish. These yeah. kids are saying, you know what? The heck with this illness. I got so much I want to do. There's no yeah. medical terms for it. There's no, but we have so many survivors like that. And that's, that's awesome. one of my speaking events is afterwards in the meet and greets, I get to meet aunts, uncles, brothers, fathers, you know, mom and dad of a wish child, but an adult will come up and introduce themselves. I'm a wish child. Oh, that's, that's me. To me, that is so special. I said, ladies and gentlemen, excuse me a minute. Because I really want to talk to this individual. Yeah. Well, and you know, that wish, I will ask them, what's your wish? And I watch their eyes. I'm trained to read facial yeah. expressions. It could be 20 years ago, and they're talking about I can see that those eyes sparkle again, yeah. whatever that wish might have been. That's awesome. You know, that, that, that mind power, when you're determined, that when your heart is lit up that much and you have that much love in your heart, it changes your chemistry physically. And then you want to fight for love and for life, you know? Yeah. And that's the power of the wish, like you say, that, that power. Somebody stepped up. Something stepped up into their heart that gave them the sense of nothing's going to end what I want to continue. And how many wish kids now that are grown that are going to make a difference in somebody else's life? And this just keeps on going and growing in ways that are just amazing, you know? So, and, and just what you said, the wish kids growing up, there's never a request for the family or the child to give back somehow to the Make a Wish Foundation. It's never even suggested. But after they grow up, or even the family, unfortunately, the child may pass away, the family will come and say, I want to volunteer. I want to help raise money. I want to fundraise and whatever I can do just to kind of pay back. But again, it's never even suggested that they do that. Yeah, it's, it's one of the greatest charities ever created one of the top charities ever created because it's all about love and giving a hundred percent about making a difference, you know? And I just, I just admire it so much. If you've not seen the movie, they have to see the movie. Wish Man. <laughs> it should on be Netflix. On Netflix. <laughs> right, on Netflix. Well, and the best part is when you see Frank driving that motorcycle, <laughs> that is the character you want to look for. Yeah, look, look, see see if you can recognize my backside. <laughs> I know. Are you Hollywood, out? riding into the sunset. That's right. <laughs> right. Do you have any other projects coming up as far as TV or movies? Yes, I do. Um, I've been contacted by a production group. We're just working on a deck right now. In fact, looking for sponsors for a TV series called Wishman Angel Patrol. And this is, if anybody remembers, first of all, Charlie's Angels back in the yes. day. And then also a home makeover, Extreme Edition, yes. where they would go in and build homes for people and so on that needed it. Uh, this concept of this show is I will have six angels that are working for me that will go out throughout the United States looking at areas that have been devastated by floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, fires, uh, veterans that need help, individuals, homeless that need help and come back and report to me <clears throat> that uh, I'm the wish man 
let's see if we can get in that community and rebuild, re help somebody out. And uh, it's it's the networks have asked for this. So we've finished the deck. Now we're looking for potential sponsors just to say I'm interested. And then hopefully by the end of August, we can submit it to the networks. Wow, and, that's, that's powerful. Yeah, so it's going to be a lot of fun. It's got the weekly series, what we're looking for. Well, you need and a Hollywood we'll, star, Frank. <laughs> Do what? You need a Hollywood star. Well, I've got one in Las Vegas on the Walk of Fame. Right, has one in Vegas. Where, where's, your, where's your star at in Vegas? My star in Vegas is right at the Paris Hotel on the Las Vegas Strip. And it's two stars down from Elvis Presley. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, and Bobby Darren is right there, too. Oh, two okay. kings side by side. That's right. <laughs> and, then I, and then I've got a star on the Coronado Island Walk of Fame. Do you oh, really? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, how flattering is that? It's so much fun, but. Yeah. And, and my wife, now, we're not going to Vegas right now because of what's going on in that. Yeah. But she loves going to Vegas. And she said, I said, we've just been there. She said, yeah, but we got to go clean your star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the excuse. <laughs> that's the excuse. <laughs> you, you just tell her that Mark Milan already cleaned it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, you, you truly are an amazing human being and inspiration and all that. I just want to say thank you for, for being here. I look forward to the movie, the, the show coming out with the six angels. I mean, if three were amazing, what imagine what six will be like. I know. <laughs> you get where to, could people get a hold of you? Yeah. Um, how do they, if people, oh, if people want to see, um, touch base with you or read more about you or know more about you, where could they go? Yeah, go to my wish of uh, my website, which is wishman one, the number one, wishman1.com. Awesome. And there's okay. a contact there. You can also purchase merchandise, uh, autographed copies of my movie, of my book. Uh, we've got some other stuff, shirts and so on, coming on there pretty soon. Wishman brand that we call it. <clears throat> yeah. And on Facebook, friend me on Facebook. I, I, I do a little research before I accept your friendship, but uh, oh, <laughs> making, yeah, making sure. Uh, I don't yeah. know if I'm your friend or not. I didn't know if I passed. Well, we are. <laughs> yeah. him, and I, him and I are friends. I know that. <laughs> yeah. But that's the biggest contact. And like I said, I'm very flattered. I get so many messages every day from all over the world. Even South Africa last week. <clears throat> I mean, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Well, but I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing you again at Secret Knock. My, my niece, Valerie, is, has CP, cerebral palsy. And I tell her about you once in a while. Maybe I'll bring her down there and she can meet meet you or something like that. She lives in uh, Phoenix, you know, and yeah. an amazing woman. She she uh, she's after they did a story on her as well as far as born different. And she's inspiring others to say we may be born different, but it doesn't mean we're, you know, we can be held back. We can still go forward and do things in life that other people can't do because of their story. We have a story that says we are born different for a reason to make a difference in somebody's life. She has a little tattoo on her arm that says ability, not disability. And I think that's pretty inspirational for us, you know. And oh, good. I'd, love, I'd love to yeah, have her, you meet her one day. And again, it's like, hey, I was taught as a young child, if you want something, you have to work for it. It's not free. If you that's want right. them, you have to work for it. There's no that's such thing as as me. If, if, if when you work for it, then you see the result, the, 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 the fulfillment. When it's handed to you, there's no appreciation. People, you know, there's no gratitude thank, when it's thank God you had to go through what you went through to become who you needed to become in this world to save all those all those children, you know. No, thank you. It didn't feel good though, did it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully the new TV show, Wish Man Angel Patrol, because they want to be the host for it, so that's gonna be fun. Yeah, that are they gonna get your good side or the front? <laughs> well, I think they get the front this time. I, they may even get me a new cowboy hat. I don't know. We'll see here. <laughs> well, well, we really appreciate you taking this time out for for us and you know for being here. We really enjoyed talking to you. And you two know, wishes were granted since we started talking. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And at Larry Wilcox, I don't think I topped you, buddy, but. <laughs> I I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure you you're you're right right there with us. So yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
So make sure you guys check out Wishman One, the number one dot com. You can put it up there, right? It's already up there. Oh, fantastic! And then uh, make sure you check out the movie on Netflix. I think he said that wow. it's going to be on Netflix for still another year. Another year. They extended it for another full year. Yes. <laughs> but it's see? Friday night, and it's Friday night movie night, right. so the, I want them to see it tonight. There you go. There you go. And, and people will share this video. We'll get even more out there, and then more donations coming in to make a wish and. And then there's there's more more feathers on your wings for when you when you depart this world, you know, and see well, all those so <laughs> so have popcorn and watch <laughs> Wishman tonight on Netflix. Were you there when I hypnotized the main actor at Secret Knock? I'm sorry, say that again. Were you at the Secret Knock when I hypnotized the main actor? Oh yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Andrew Steele. Oh yeah, yeah. Andrew. He was Andrew funny. William Steele. Yeah. We we should get him on. We should get him on on one of these and, and tell tell us about. Yeah, this. he's in he's in Australia right now uh, because there's no work obviously in Hollywood. So yeah. he's back home in Australia. But well, what a, what a magnificent job he did on that movie. Oh, yes. yeah. I mean that that man studied so hard for that role. Again, it wasn't given to him. He worked and worked for it. Yeah. Well, he was great. He he played that role. I mean, oh. right on. But the only issue was when we were auditioning, he wasn't quite as good looking as I was in the mid 30s. So <laughs> that was one of the setbacks. But that's know. why they show you back. They would have canned him. <laughs> 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 they, they had to do the camera that way. If they said, once they see Frank's face, they're gonna they're, the whole movie. They're just gonna be focused on Frank. Where's Frank? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we appreciate you, Frank, everything you've done. And we're going to have everybody that watches this video share it, comment on it, watch the movie, let us know what your feelings are. Check it out for sure. Again, you're an amazing man. I look forward to seeing you back back at Secret Knock. And next time we get to Phoenix, Yolanda and I are taking you from Biscuits and Gravy up in Prescott. There you go. There you go. Lunch at the right. Palace. So. Well, you have a good rest of the day. And again, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Uncle Frank. <laughs> So long, and again, thank you for having me on. All thank right. you, my friend. All right. <laughs> well, there, there well, you got there it. You that got is it. the man from Make a Wish. Start it. I mean, you have to go watch the movie to appreciate what he did, what he did, where he came from, how hard he worked. You know what? Nothing was given to him. Nothing. Only the opportunity to say, I'm going to make a difference in somebody else's life because somebody made a difference in mine. That's your purpose, and he's there all about serving purpose. We, and also the meaning, the meaning oh, behind the, the make a wish, yeah, and I, I didn't know where, wanna, yeah. where the inspiration came from. And you know, it, it's it's touched so many kids' lives, and, and it's still Everybody's doing it, lives. you know, it's still changing lives. And it's, um, and we're going to continue this, yes, we're going to continue, continue the this. journey because it's only going to get greater, bigger, better, and all that. And I didn't even want to bring about the dog because I would have started crying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't talk about the dog. You, no, have, to, you have to watch the movie. You gotta watch the movie. Awesome gotta watch the movie. Um, Let if us you're know. a dog lover, you're gonna cry and you're gonna understand what we're talking about when we say the dog scene. Because it's not I, doesn't get hurt. Doesn't get hurt. No, doesn't get hurt. No, no, no. The dog doesn't get hurt. No, no, no. Nothing like that. But it is still. You're gonna see what Frank had to go through to become the man he is today. And maybe in life, you have to go through through some things to become the man or the woman you need to become as well. And stop giving up. And start showing up, and that's that's what this movie's all about. And remember, your story can change someone else's life, and touch somebody else's life also, and you can make a difference in somebody else's life. So you know, we I talk about you know not playing the victim, you know, women playing the victim. It's for everybody. It's not just for women. It's for everybody. We we all gone through struggles. But our story can change somebody's life, it can touch somebody's life, and it can make a difference in somebody's life if we share it. Where did you say wish man? That's right. It'll be crystal clear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like us on, uh, like the videos, share. Like, and share, else. and we Comment. will see you uh, Sunday for our cooking show. Um, oh, today's Friday. Yes, today's, today's Friday. Friday. He's, he never knows what day it is. I swear, he never knows. I just think they ought to, um, they ought to watch our video. We're posting more videos. We are posting some fun videos, so we'll check it out. Check it out. Check it out. And also, we, uh, yeah, we'll see you Sunday if 
for some reason, this one decides to go rent a bobcat. Gotta rent a bobcat. And go in the yard and we don't have a cooking show, I will come and explain to you why we don't have a cooking Mac show. Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. Because I am going to do this. I'm going to continue to dye my hair. I'm going to dye my hair. Continue to dye your hair. You haven't even started to dye I your hair. I dyed all this white. I dyed all white. That's not dyeing it. That's your natural color. You're getting old. It's white. I'm like mine. That's still beautiful and golden brown. I'm old. Look at my hair compared to yours. I am beautiful, <laughs> and age can't turn me down. Sorry. <laughs> you are absolutely nuts. I have to go do something. I don't know what yet. No, he's dying. He's dying. Get the I'm serious. He's dying to get in the backyard. Number one. Number two, he's dying to buy a tractor. And number three, now he wants to rent a bobcat. That's who comes back to so, thank you guys for listening. If, we, if you don't see us on Sunday, you'll probably some, see some crazy video with him and a bobcat or a tractor in the backyard. Monday, doing uh, something. Monday is Michael. Monday is Michael Nitty. Yes, Monday we have Michael Nitty, Coach Michael Nitty. So the stay bad, tuned. He's a bad and, man. <laughs> no, he's not a bad man. All right. Thank Until you for then. joining us. Putting on my shades. Now the future looks bright. All right, share this video, like it. Thank you very much. Check out, let us know what you think about Wishman. Comment and let us know what we can help you any way we can. I'm Mark. This is Yolanda. We are together. We are together. All right, right here. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>